Let's see all the tabs that I have open, I think. <laughs> all of the things. All right. So come on. All right. So following up from last week, we'll start with some cognitive interventions and then move to some emotional um, interventions. These are best done together. Um, but one may resonate more with you, which is totally fine. Um, so I'll just take you through some cognitive um, processing and some interventions that move more with the intellect. So again, cognitive and emotional are best coupled in this work. I would argue they're best coupled in general, but what you will find is that some um, clients really they resonate a little bit more with the intellect or they may resonate a little bit more with the emotion. Um, so when you're working from a cognitive um, approach, you are really going to look at the negative perceptions, like these internalized narratives, um, these messages that um, the client has potentially internalized, things like beliefs about themselves, beliefs about others, beliefs about the environment, such as safety, um, the intentions and motivations of others. Uh, so you'll be really investigating what they believe about each of those aspects. So likely what will come out is some sort of negative assumption. You know, the world is inherently dangerous. Um, I deserved what happened to me. I am inherently flawed. Um, you know, just pretty negative things. So you, when those things come out, um, you're going to want to not necessarily um, challenge them right away, but you're going to want to at least for you kind of in your mind or on your notebook, however you kind of keep notes, make note of that. Um, so you really want to counter the eventually these negative assumptions with more affirming and empowering messaging. Um, but you have to give that space because these, these are cognitions that the, the client has like a stronghold on. Um, so to say that's not true can be received, though the intentions are good, can be received as pretty dismissive. Um, so just know that as you start to allow the client, you know, give this client space to verbalize what they're, they've been thinking, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, the, the power of verbalization is sometimes, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this, we talk to ourselves um, quite a bit. So, um, so we don't, we're not even fully aware because what we're saying is internal. The, the process of actually voicing um, what is in our head can be pretty powerful in terms of awareness. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. So what you wanna do when you're you know, creating this space for uh, a verbalization or even writing down like what we talked about last week. Um, the client has an opportunity to hopefully develop a more detailed and coherent understanding of what happened. Um, and then be able to, once you, um, once you have that down or you verbalized it, it gives it more space for hopefully clinical improvement to happen. Um, sorry, I'm having... <laughs> Daniel's trying to get in, um, but I'm wondering if he's having any issues. I have to keep admitting him. So that's why I'm sorry, kind of pausing and stuff as I'm going. Okay, so more about cognitive processing. Um, so again, the hope is that you allow space and that the client leans in to the opportunity, I guess, opportunity uh, space <laughs> um, to be able to verbalize this in a detailed way. So cognitive processing happens when you have as many details and as much information as possible. And again, we talked about this last week, there may be holes, there may be gaps. That doesn't mean that the cognitive processing isn't happening. It means that the client is like, 
doing the best that they can with what they have. So again, we'll, we'll talk about this later of, you know, some hesitancy sometimes with clients to emote, to, to admit the amount of psychological and emotional trauma that they've been th through because it feels like a win for the perpetrator. Um, so with cognitive processing and many of you, this, you know, for both CBT or TFCBT and the CPT, this is an element of it. The those are very seated in the cognitive aspect of processing. So when the client describes the trauma repeatedly, the hope is that they're um, becoming some level of desensitized, right? So one of the hopes in trauma processing is that the client recognizes that, you know, this is part of their story. This is part of their life. Um, it is something that is in their life history, their narrative. But the hope is that if they do think about it, or if they do talk about it, that they're not so emotionally activated. Um, so cognitive processing helps with becoming more hopefully accepting of the experience, accepting of the self, having been through that experience um, and less emotionally charged to the point where they don't feel um, their body doesn't automatically dissociate. You know, they have some tolerance for this emotional experience that the lived experience brings. So also with cognitive processing, one of the hopes is that, so there is some like reliving of the experience of the trauma. So as we know, as we've read, um, many of the approaches speak from a here and now, meaning like go back into the space that you were, you know, talk as if you were, talk in the present as if you were currently in that experience. Um, so that's part of the desensitization, but the processing piece is the reminder that you are safe. You are not in that experience right now. You are not experiencing that trauma right now. And then the hope is that you're building tool, helping the client build tools and skills so that when they are viewing it from a truly different perspective, because you're pulling back some of the layers of those like residual effects of the trauma. So when you're verbally recounting the event, um, you, as the therapist, you're assisting the client in kind of uncovering some of those assumptions, beliefs, and perceptions that were encoded by the trauma. So remember, we know that trauma, we, we experience on a, it on a molecular level. So there, every fiber of our being is affected when it comes to trauma. So as the client is sharing, you're asking some questions to uncover some of those assumptions, beliefs, and allowing them to um, potentially like compare, you know, so when they're in the trauma, right? So when they're talking about, you know, like this is happening to me right now because I deserve it. This is happening to me right now because of some bad thing I did in the past. And this is karma for what I did, you know, whatever messaging, whatever um, narrative they're telling themselves, you can have them share that. So that's a very true and real valid thought and then have them talk from the actual here and now. So, you know, now in this moment with me, when, while you're safe, you know, you've, you've talked through some of this trauma, tell me a little bit about how you believe now. So whereas before I thought it was maybe karma for something I had done in the past, um, now I know that it, I wasn't at fault. Um, so just allowing space for them to, for there to be that comparison. So you are going to work, you are a team with your client. So you're going to work with them to create a more accurate model of what happened. So again, it's, uh, whatever negative assumptions or negative, and you'll know it when you hear it of, you know, I was deserving of this. Um, it's because I'm bad. Or, you know, we, when some of you are taking the CPT training of the, and we talked about this last week, like the myth of a just world, um, that good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people, this bad thing happened to me, therefore I must be bad. Um, so potentially challenging something like the myth of a just world of, um, you know, the possibility of things being 
quite random and like bad things happening to good people. Um, so things like that. So this is an interactive process that is hoped to foster a more positive self perception. And then for the client to be able to reinterpret some of the bad behaviors or the deservingness or the presumed inadequacies of themselves and in a, in a different light, in a more accurate light. So no one is inherently deserving of any male treatment, um, but it, what the client is trying to do is make sense of what the hell happened to me. If, if the world is just, or if I can't make sense of this thing, I must change something about myself or at least my beliefs about myself to fit because the uh, ambivalence, the un, not knowing the, the seemingly dichotomously or dichotomous simultaneously existing thoughts are too much for me to bear. So I'm going to make them make sense, even if I come out on the crappy end of this. So a note about us as clinicians. So I I can I know from your reflections and you know the work that you've submitted thus far um, that y'all have great intentions and you care and you're affected by these things. So one thing that um, I just want to point out is, and, and I alluded to this a little bit last week, um, is that sometimes what we may feel pressure to do internally, <laughs> you know, like, so, so imagine you have a person steeped in shame uh, sitting across from you, um, who has experienced something so traumatic and so awful. Um, and they are suffering. You're seeing human suffering right in front of you. And I think that there's this, you know, inherent responsibility that we feel justly, of course, but not over, like not this omnipresent, like we're not responsible for this human being all the time. We're responsible for this human being when they're in our care. So, um, sometimes when you have this person that is, you know, expressing despair and these just very difficult things to see another human being experiencing, we may feel a desire to like voice an opinion, like for the, what the first one says, uh, regarding the lack of culpability of the person sitting in front of us. And then this, the cruelty of the perpetrator. So, you know, that would seem pretty common sense, right? Like we want to help relinquish the responsibility from the person sitting in front of us and put it rightfully on the person that perpetrated. So in small doses, this can be pretty appropriate and helpful. So it's almost like a sprinkling of a thought of a, um, you know, I can really hear that you're um, feeling really responsible for what happened to you. I, I really want to highlight or punctuate to you that it was not your fault um, and leave it. So sometimes what we do is um, what we can dismiss some of the suffering um, and also believe that something that we said was like this epiphany creating statement um, where it's, it wasn't your fault. And then to be like, all right, there, that's it. <laughs> you know, like we think that there's a lot of weight to what we have to say in that. You can't dismiss the emotional experience of this and for, and for how long this person has been trying to make sense of this and potentially blaming themselves for what happened. Um, so these statements rarely change the client's opinion. So if you believe that this is, you know, a, a part of your intervention that you just want to consistently share, um, it can backfire in a way because it's so, it can be so easy for us to say, particularly if we haven't had a, well, even if we've had an experience of trauma, but what can happen is the, the client can feel very alienated in that of like, oh, it's so easy for you to say, um, you clearly don't understand me. Um, we clearly don't understand each other in a way that I thought we did because you're really not putting the weight on my shame or on 
my responsibility or can't you see therapist that it really was my fault? You keep telling me that it wasn't. And I'm just like really not feeling heard and understood by you. So you don't want to, you don't want to validate and, um, you know, like reinforce, reinforce the, okay, well you feel it's your fault. Well, fine. It's your fault. You don't want to do that, but you also don't want to hammer into them. No, it wasn't your fault. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to stand for hearing you say that anymore because then, you know, you're shutting down some of this full expression of theirs, right? They may need to say, it's my fault. It's my fault. It's my fault. Many, many, many times before and doing that subsequent work before they actually believe that it's not their fault. So with this clinical experience suggests that cognitive therapy is rarely helpful when the, when you merely disagree with the client about their cognitions or memories. So that can't be what happened. Um, you know, I, th I think you're misremembering these kinds of things are, um, you can hear how the intention may be good behind that of no, okay, we need to restructure this. You know, you're you're steeping in this false narrative that makes you culpable. I, I, I we need to change this, but you have to respect the process. So that's you know one of the messages we come back to all the time in this class is patience. Um, so cognitive interventions are most effective when you provide opportunities for the clients to experience the original trauma related thoughts and self perceptions while at the same time, considering a more contemporary or logical perspective. So you're simultaneously allowing the existence of one that is not helpful, but it's their truth. And you're really showing acceptance of that individual in their process. So just wanting to really take time to punctuate this and say it's not enough just to disagree or to try, try to challenge. In fact, it can be, um, it can do more harm than help. So with cognitive processing, there's two major ways to help the client remember and re-experience um, their trauma in the process of treatment. So the first is by describing it in detail and the second is about writing about it. Um, so this is where that, um, you know, decreasing activation, that tie trading that, you know, keeping a pulse on the anxiety, like whatever, um, emotions come up in when they are experiencing their trauma, doing your best, trying to like, you know, keep a hold on that. So in the first, when you're describing it in detail, you're going to encourage the client to describe it in as much detail as tolerable, including whatever feeling, sorry, I have he or she here, they experienced um, during and after their victimization experience. And the second is a form of cognitive processing is one that hopefully um, isn't all that the client does. We talked about this a little bit last week and writing is important. There also is a lot of power in verbalizing. Um, so this may be something where the client is you know, initially not really able to verbalize it, then you go to writing, but after writing, the hope is that the person can read it, you know, really allowing for their, um, their experience and their emotions to emerge through this. So this can be homework. Um, if the client doesn't do the homework, if they don't write, um, that's something that you should be prepared to do in session, um, because them not writing it may be a form of avoidance. Um, so this is where the hope is that you have a, you know, a good working alliance, a good therapeutic alliance to say, you know, that's okay that you didn't write it. Um, I'm curious, like, tell me a little bit about what was going on. Um, oh, I just got really busy. Okay. Um, did you think about it? So you're, you're wanting to kind of assess uh, where they were in terms of their emotional readiness or something. Um, and then say, okay, so today what we're going to do is we're going to write, and then you're going to gauge how the client is doing. And they may be very, um, like agitated about that or really not want to do that. And that's where you want to be very explicit about the avoidance, um, because likely they've already exhibited, um, not necessarily with you, like a pattern of avoidance, but likely they've voiced how they've coped in the past. And there was very likely some avoidance in that. So to really explain to them, I really want to provide you a different experience here. 
And yes, avoidance is comfortable, but you also know the residual consequences of avoidance is that your trauma stays with you. And I really want for us to not ha have you experience that right now. Um, so let's dip our toes in the water. We'll go at your pace. I'll keep checking in with you. Um, but I think it's time to take some, you know, power over this narrative. So Socratic questioning is something that you very well may be familiar with, but essentially it's a series of gentle, usually open-ended inquiries that allow the client to progressively examine the assumptions and interpretations they've made, sp specifically with trauma in their victimization experience, but Socratic questioning works with really any sort of presenting trauma or presenting problem. So um, these are just some examples of questions that you can ask. Um, so what was I going to say about this? Oh, so this is potentially one of the things that you can do in place of a direct challenge. So Socratic questioning is a very gentle way of potential of challenging. So do you have any, did you have any thoughts while the, this was happening? What were they like? Do you think there was anything else you could have done? Um, so somebody might say, for example, as a child, um, you know, I, I should have been able to like overpower my, my perpetrator and, you know, they were 70, 70 pounds and their perpetrator was 200 pounds. Um, so like, how do you think, so I, I'm going to guess at, you know, 10 years old, you weighed about this much and your perpetrator was about this. Um, how do you think you would have done that? So that's a Socratic question. Um, that is a very, um, soft, gentle challenge of that. Um, so just some, uh, options for you here and like what Socratic questions can look like specific to trauma. So some other questions, if you're seeing, if you're hearing some distorted beliefs, um, is there any way in which you might be underestimating your abilities when you say that, um, what makes you believe that your assumption is or would be true? What are the chances something like that would happen again in the future? Um, so again, it, the, it's not saying you're wrong, we need to change these things. It's really just asking these open-ended questions for the, to give the client space to evaluate that on their own. So with cognitive therapy, there are several goals to, you want to assist the client in a fully more accurate exploration of their beliefs and their assumptions and um, talk specifically about the context that they were created. Um, and so as we've talked about, you don't want to lecture, argue, or label any beliefs as wrong um, or inaccurate or anything like that. It's really about providing space and really being patient with the client's process. So these cognitions should be reviewed. And so there, it's one thing to have, so if I'm the client and you ask a question and I share my verbalization, right? Like whatever narrative I have going on, when you reflect that back to me, that's another level of hearing. So I hear myself, I may not fully, you know, like, process and feel exactly what that was. But when I hear it from another person, just remember there's a lot of power in reflection. Um, it really does hit the ear different when you have a different person saying even exactly what you just said. Um, so you want to reflect it back to the client as a very understandable reaction to something that was very overwhelming and it, and that the anxiety and distress that they were experiencing makes sense. Um, so there may also be some idea or some element of incomplete information. There may be some coercion, some confusion um, that's happening. Um, and then understanding, like voicing that whatever means that they chose to survive through not only the experience, but these, again, these residual consequences of the experience um, was, makes sense. And they were, do, they were protecting themselves the best they could. They were surviving the best they could. And now that survival isn't, you know, the, um, 
the bar <laughs> that they're trying to clear, that they have um, more aspirations to live, to be present, to feel fulfilled, um, that that's going to take a different set of skills. Surviving and thriving, I guess, for lack of a better term, are different experiences. So these Tra trauma related cognitions uh, should be treated not as a product of the client, like something inherently wrong with the client. You know, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, as MFTs, we don't even really think like that. We don't think in terms of individual pathology. You know, we really think in terms of systems, and part of the system is the environment. I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> um, but it's these trauma-related cognitions are these initial perceptions and assumptions that happened and now they require updating. Again, it's this sticking with the cognitive therapy theme, it's these old schemas that they have, um, they've lived and they've believed and that um, have really affected them and informed them and the, they're no longer necessary. So, we're providing safety and support for them to be able to rethink and kind of update their operating system. So not only is it important to process the cognitions, it's also, there's another step of this of creating meaning, making meaning. Um, making meaning is a really big piece of grief work. And I would argue that grief is inherent in trauma processing and in a traumatic experience. So remember, it's not a loss. You don't just grieve like a death or a breakup or something. You can grieve like the future that you thought you had, um, your sense of self. Um, you know, there's so many experiences of grief and so many things that inform an experience of grief. Um, so you may, as a clinician, encounter these distortions um, that have formed regarding the meaning of symptoms that they're experiencing. So these involve beliefs that the intrusive reliving, numbing avoidance, this hyperarousal um, represent a loss of control and major psychopathology. Um, so there may have been a loss of control in the moment, but that is no longer something that is existing, that they, they have some level of control um, or they may believe, you know, something is really inherently wrong with me. Um, so again, the, you may have a diagnosis that allows for the client to access resources and things like that. But the hope is that the, the, the message that you send to your client is that, you know, something really, really horrible happened to you and you are doing your best to heal from it and you're in control now of your healing. Um, so with this, the meaning making, a part of that is psychoeducation. So you're going to facilitate the cognitive processing of these perceptions, and you're gonna ask the client questions, um, like what might a non-pathologizing explanation for your symptom be? Um, like, you know, as you're self-medicating with substances or something like that, um, you can provide psychoeducation on whether the, the symptoms actually indicate psychosis or mental illness. Um, so an example here is whether flashbacks are the same thing as hallucin hallucinations or whether it really is paranoid to be fearful of a trauma reminiscent situation. Um, so that's where, you know, the client is taking something that is pretty um, understandable and potentially taking it to a place that puts the onus of pathology on themselves. And then psychoeducation about whether it's better to actively experience post-traumatic stress, uh, stress or to shut down um, these memories. And as we know, you can't process them. You can't move anywhere with them until you actually sit with them. Um, so there may be uh, lots of questions about the re-experiencing. And we've talked about that before of, you know, I have successfully avoided um, processing these things for a long time. So why would I, why would I voluntarily step into the re-experiencing? Like that's a very valid question, but it's a really important piece of what we're doing.
So developing a coherent narrative. In addition to the cognitive processing, um, you wanna make a broader meaning of the context. So with the authors, they said that their clinical experience suggests that the client descriptions of past traumatic events often become more detailed um, when they tell them repeatedly and they're discussed in therapy. So I wanted to highlight this because it's not this like one and done experience where, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, watching a movie multiple times, you see different things, you notice different things like reading a book uh, several times, you, just other different things pop out. And it may be that, you know, you were processing in a different way the first time that you read it or watched it. Um, may also be that you're in a different place. You know, if you watch a movie now that you watched when you were, you know, an adolescent, you're going to have different meaning around it because you have a different lived experience, more lived experience, you have more perspective. Um, so this is no different than that. Um, I mean, emotionally, yes, it's much more taxing, but I just wanted to hopefully give you a kind of a relatable example of the importance of, um, or the possibility of it being different when you go through something more than once. Um, so the client descriptions, oh, whoops, sorry. Oh, this is the same, whoops. <laughs> ah, um, we're losing control over here. Um, so in partial contrast to cognitive processing, narrative interventions support the development of a broader explanation and overbridging story. Um, so cognitive processing is going to look at the details and is going to, you know, challenge and replace some thoughts and things like that, whereas narrative is meant to help with this very cohesive um, story. So start to end. Um, so you're going to the overbridging story of the traumatic event, anything that happened beforehand and the effects of it. So what happened before the trauma and then what happened after that's where the narrative piece is. So cognitive changes arising from non overwhelming emotional activation. So we'll talk about the levels of activation and stuff like that in, um, later in this PowerPoint, but basically this it's this increased ability to experience negative affect without the associated catastrophizing cognition. So this is when you're providing some of that psychoeducation around it, re-experiencing and the importance of that. And when you're really getting questioned by your client, like, why can't I just like not think of it? And if I don't think about it long enough, then hopefully I'll just forget or my mind will, you know, acclimate to this. It will it will come with me and, and I won't ever think about it again and won't be affected by it. Um, it, so doing this, so when you're processing, when, and making sure that it's titrated and that the client is not, um, overwhelmed or, over, or at very activated, it increases tolerance. So, and then it doesn't come with the cognitions of, you know, something is very wrong with me. I am in danger. Um, these types of things that come when somebody's emotionally activated. So it's this tolerance for the telling and the living of that at the same time, the ability to articulate yourself in terms of emotion. So this is where a person is also potentially like really stifled their emotional range um, you know, again, very understandably so, and it's giving the client more of a vocabulary to express how am I feeling. So it's this connection to their emotional experience, which helps um, encourage more of a whole self experience and a feeling real, like we talked about last week. So emotional processing is a little bit different than cognitive processing. Um, so it occurs when exposure to trauma reminiscent stimuli, one, triggers associated implicit or explicit memories that then activate an emotional response and initially co-encoded with these memories and the activated emotional response are not reinforced in the external environment. So this is where we talk about that discrepancy disparity. Um, in fact, while they're in therapy, 
these initial responses are counter conditioned by an opposite emotional experience because they're not being invalidated, they're not being questioned, they're being supported, they are safe. So that's what the counter conditioning is. I'll go over that again just to remind you. And then the hope is that it leads to an extinction of the original memory emotion association. So that's kind of the stages, the steps um, of emotional processing. So intrinsic prop, uh, processing, so that just means like it comes from within, um, but this is something that you can assist with as the therapist. So you want to coach them, guide them through um, the processing, right? But you're also monitoring um, their level of emotional activation and you're controlling it. So you're, you know, you're not controlling it, you're co-controlling it, but you're being very honoring of the client's experience of, do we need to pause? Let's take a break. Um, just being very honoring of that. So you're providing enough therapeutic exposure that extinction or counter conditioning can eventually occur. So counter conditioning is, so in the past when the client has um, maybe experienced the trauma where there's this emotional experience that isn't um, attended to. So then the, it amps up, it amps up. So there's, you know, anxiety, there's a sense of overwhelm, there's this loss of control. But what you're providing in the therapeutic space is when that emotional experience happens, that they have validation, that they feel a sense of control. So these like consequential emotional experiences aren't, aren't, aren't happening. In fact, they're, you're creating a condition in which they feel that they do have some control over the experience so that they aren't overwhelmed as they are um, talking about it. And there isn't really a, a need to avoid because they're learning how to, to, to live with that reality. Um, So we've talked about the therapeutic window and uh, just to reiterate, it's essentially when the client is emotionally activated, but it's not overwhelming. So remember undershooting the therapeutic window is, you know, nothing's really happening. The client's not really stimulated. They're not activated in any way. And if growth does happen in that way, it happens very slowly. So um, you want to have some emotional activation. The goal is not to have no emotional activation for the client to be like super calm the entire time. That's one, unrealistic, and two, it's, it's not therapeutic. Um, so then overshooting is that overstimulating, potentially re-traumatizing place. Um, so you're not allowing the client to adequately accommodate or desensitize any sort of previously activated material before you're triggering new material. Um, so this very well, this is something that um, therapists who are not trauma informed are really at risk of doing, particularly because of that last part of the sentence here that it can be seen as resistance. So if you are not trauma informed, which all of you are, um, you're learning to be, um, is that you are, you're kind of pushing to your tolerance as a therapist, which is completely emotionally removed in some ways. Um, and so you are, if the client wants to stop or is telling you these very honest experiences of being overwhelmed, then it, you can label it very easily as resistance of like, no, we've got to push through this. We've got to push through this. And likely what would happen is this person won't come back to you. So whenever, I, I think a really good default in this work is to do that cue of, can you do 30 more seconds? Can we, can we stay here just a little bit longer? Um, so once that initial, I don't want to do this anymore happens, you push just a little bit, and then you continue to allow the client to dictate that. So there is that, there is, it is very appropriate to give that little push that asking is, can we go 30 more seconds? Um, and if the client says, no, absolutely, I can't, then you don't. 
if the client says, oh, I, I think I can, I think I can, um, then you're really going to look for nonverbals. Um, Cause you know, if they're like shaking uncontrollably or something like that and saying like, I can do it. Um, you might want to have a little bit more of a conversation about the, the nonverbals. So this is um, pretty common just in terms of the intensity of a general therapeutic session. So in these 50 minutes, so you know this is time over, um, over activation here. So intensity refers to the therapist's awareness and relative control of the level of emotional activation occurring within the session. So this, again, this is very common, a session in terms of intensity, ideally, very rarely, just so you know, um, looks like a bell curve, a, a standard bell curve. So um, the beginning of the session, pretty not activated, you know, you're checking in, kind of, you know, joining whatever you're doing. And then in those uh, first few, full min few minutes, and I'll actually delineate this in more detail later in this presentation, um, you know, you're building and then mid session is when the activation should be at its highest. And then you should be able to um, move toward lack of activation. Um, sometimes it, you might take a person out of session, like, you know, less activated, but you're, um, you know, giving them some tools or something. Cause sometimes, you know, 50 minutes isn't enough. And sometimes you don't have the ability to run into a next hour. because maybe you have back-to-back -back clients. I would say if you have availability in the next hour, try to bring them down a little bit more, take a few more minutes. Um, but sometimes that's just not the luxury that we have. So some constraints. Um, so there are cases where any level of memory processing overshoots the window. The person becomes completely overwhelmed and this doesn't matter, like your effort as a clinician doesn't really affect it. Um, so when this occurs, just letting you know that there are some things that might be happening, that the trauma is so recent or severe that these conditioned emotional response activation is just inherently overwhelming. So it's like maybe not enough time has passed um, for the client to be in a space of processing. The client has insufficient affect regulation capacity. So that might indicate to you to like go back into, you know, phase one of all of this and just do a lot of psychoeducation. And then they may just generally be suffering from high levels of comorbid emotional distress. Um, and so any sort of distress is incapacitating. Um, so just letting you know that these are some things that could be happening. And then um, any sort of emotional or therapeutic exposure may be contraindicated if any of these things are present. Um, so contraindicated just meaning like shouldn't happen, not encouraged. Um, so if the person has very high anxiety, so these are all things that you would assess for, you would screen for these things. Um, you know, if they have overwhelming guilt and shame associated with the traumatic event. So this, again, the exposure piece, this is phase two. So you may just be in phase one for a while, or you may remember sometimes the gains that are made in phase one of trauma treatment are totally sufficient and very satisfactory to the client. Um, so, you know, this is another thing where a well-intentioned clinician might say, wait, 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 there's like two more phases to go through, um, and, you know, impose that on the client. Um, remember if it's something that they feel good about, um, and they feel like they've done the work great. Um, so they, you may end at phase one. So components, again, uh, these are some things I just wanted to redefine for you because they're extremely important to have all of these components there. So first we'll start with exposure. It's any activity engaged in by the therapist or the client that provokes or triggers client memories of the traumatic event. So you are exposing them to memories. So it's been described as repeated or extended exposure. It can be in vivo or through imagination. Um, which we've talked about. So in vivo can happen both in session and out of session. That can be something that there's homework um, and imagination can happen both in both as well. In vivo tends to happen more outside of session and then imagining happens more so in session. Uh, then, so there's 
systematic desensitization, which we talked about. So the client, you're asking the client to recall non-overwhelming, but moderately distressing traumatic events. And so the hope is that the context of therapy is very safe and that they feel supported. And then what you're going to do is gradually increase kind of the intensity. So I always think of it as like this um, risk. Can you guys, I don't know if you guys can see me. <laughs> can you guys see me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. So there's this risk and safety. Um, so if, if this is the, um, so if these are the bars of complete, I'm, I am, it, this is so risky. I can't even go there. And this is so safe that no change is happening. Um, you have what's considered like a comfort zone, right? Where, you know, if on you have the edge of risk here, the edge of safety here, and the hope is as you are moving, so if risk is over here, as you are going through systematic desensitization, that even the, the like the comfort zone kind of shifts, whereas things that would have been, oh my gosh, so overwhelming, so risky, you know, with continued exposure and with continued skills, that they are less risky. So you're kind of moving the needle in terms of comfort. Um, so what the therap or what the authors of this book are doing is they are advocating for more of a permissive approach. So instead of being constrained by a, to a single trauma, um, so sometimes with exposure, you only allow for, cause you wanna like, some people wanna stay pretty, um, focused in the trauma that they um, only allow for the con talking of one, talking about one, and then they hope that they, it, kind of, it like generalizes to others. Um, so you kind of start with the most triggering one. And then you, then the hope is that, well, if you can conquer this, that anything that was less triggering is probably, you're probably capable of doing that on your own. So the authors um, are advocating for a more permissive approach that instead of being constrained by a single trauma, they suggest that the trauma survivor be allowed to discuss and therefore expose themselves to whatever trauma seems important at any given time um, or any part of a memory that may be triggered by another memory. So you have the option to do either. Um, this is just a suggestion of the authors of the book that we are reading. So explaining the value of therapeutic exposure. So again, you're definitely going to have clients that are like, wait, 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 <laughs> you're asking me to do what? Like, how is this possibly helpful for me? Um, so you're gonna do some pre-briefing. So again, this is psychoeducation. Um, you never, you never want the client to go into an experience not having a full grasp and a full understanding of the importance or the benefit of why you're doing it. So like you don't ever, I really don't encourage you to ever say, just trust me because guess what? A perpetrator has probably said that to them. So you don't want, like that can, that statement in and of itself can be triggering. Um, so just saying, I am going to let you know at every single step of the way. So you are informed, so you can consent to this. Um, so with therapeutic exposure, with, you know, some very understandable, uh, you know, hesitancy to go into this, you're explaining the rationale for it. It's general methodology prior to any onset of formal treatment. So this would be in that informed consent session, in that initial session to say, hey, here's what you can experience, um, expect from me. We will go at your pace. Some of the things that I'm talking about right now may sound so overwhelming and so impossible, um, and that's okay. Along the way, we're going to build skills, we're going to build safety, we're going to build trust, where you are going to feel differently about these things. Um, and I'll continue to talk to you about it. So um, that would be something that you could include in that initial session. So if you do not explain this sufficiently, the process and the effects of it may really seem illogical and you're stressing them out and triggering them for, I don't understand why. And now I'm feeling exploited. Now I'm feeling betrayed. Um, so the client very well could automatically resist this and avoid this. So 
if the exposure can be explained so that the client understands the reason for this distressing procedure, it's usually not hard, hard to form a positive client therapist alliance and a shared appreciation for the process. So just this is really just punctuating the importance of explaining the value of this. So you can also provide them, um, this is just a sample cue of some exposure homework. So you have them write a page or two about whatever happened. These are just you know, examples, include as much detail. So this is literally like a cue that you can give to your clients or write this down and have them do it. So include as much detail about it as you can remember, be specific as possible. For instance, what happened? How were you feeling? What did you think? Did it, what did anyone else say? What did anyone else do? Um, you don't have to do it all at once. You can do this in little chunks. Um, sometimes it takes people several times, you know, pieces of time to do this. Then after you're done writing, read it to yourself at least once before our next session. If it's too upsetting to read it at once, try reading as much as you can and then read the rest when you're able. So this is just a, um, an example homework for trauma work. So then activation, this is the, the conditioned emotional responses, those CERs, um, such as fear, sadness, or horror that are triggered by the memories. And then the trauma-specific cognition reaction. So these intrusive negative perceptions, these feelings of hopelessness, helplessness. Um, so the, it's both an emotional and a cognitive reaction. And in order for optimal activation to occur, there should be as little avoidance as reasonably possible during the exposure process. So as you're asking the client to talk about or write about what, whatever their, you know, their traumatic experience, you are helping to maintain temperature so you're not, so activation is what we talk about when we're sh overshooting or undershooting the therapeutic window, that they may be um, very overwhelmed with these conditioned emotional responses. They may be, you know, ruminating in these cognitive reactions. So you do not want that. So I'll just go over both increasing activation and decreasing activation, then we'll take a break. So these are just some questions to ask them to increase the activation. So if you're noticing, for example, that they're like, cool, you check in with them, you know, can you, can we do a little bit more? How are we doing on a you know, scale of one to 10 in terms of your, and you can explain to them, you can give them, you create a scale with your client about activation on a scale of one to 10 in terms of activation. Where are you? Oh, I'm at a four. Um, you know, is it, are you okay if we go to a six? Okay, cool. And then these are some questions that you're um, asking. What were you feeling? How did you feel when that happened? How are you feeling right now? So again, it's this uh, more full experience of you're not just asking them what was going on in their trauma experience. You're also checking in and having in and conditioning them or giving them some practice with checking in with themselves. Um, and then, so here, when you are um, potentially noticing some avoidance, these are some things that you can say to them, you're doing well, try to stay with the feelings, don't go away now, you're doing great, stay with it. Um, so the clinician, you can increase activation not only by discouraging, cognitive or emotional avoidance, but also increasing the emotional experience. So often this involves requesting more details about the traumatic event and responding in ways that focus on the client's emotional issues. So these are uh, ways to start it. And then these are this last piece is a way to keep it going. So again, this is to increase activation. Now, if you notice that somebody is very, is overactivated, you're overshooting the therapeutic window, you can redirect the client to less upsetting material. Um, you can focus on any of the, you know, relaxation techniques that we've been talking about in class or experiencing in class. You can direct the conversation to a less emotionally charged aspect of the event. Um, and then you may also potentially go back to some skill development and reiterate um, maybe something that you learned previously, you know, practice it again. Um, so if you suspect based on observations of the client that activation is likely to exceed the therapeutic window in any given circumstance, it's important that you ensure the safety by reducing the intensity and pace. So if, if you think that that might happen, 
slow it down, check in with your client. So you have these ways to increase the activation, ways to decrease the activation. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the share, pause this restrictions on that or anything since we're on the topic. Okay, if you do, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, this unfortunately is going to be, particularly if you're doing the presentation, this is unfortunately going to be one of the assignments that I really can't give an extension on. Um, so if you have any questions or anything, please let me know. Um, you know, if you foresee anything, you know, coming up, just talk to me. Um, but I really am going to need this on the due date. Okay, let's keep going. All right, so we're in the therapeutic space, right? So you are, you have realized you have overshot the therapeutic window. So here are some ways, some techniques, some very explicit things for you to say, to take responsibility for, um, with, to remediate that window error. Um, so you, one of the, one of the first things you can do is reduce the duration and the intensity of the current activation. So this sentence is this like point will make a little bit more sense when I talk more in detail about that bell curve that I alluded to earlier. Um, so things like relaxation, breathing techniques, um, some more cognitive interventions. So if you're finding somebody's emotionally activated, what's something you can do, you can go to the intellect. Um, so it's this just general shift away from any sort of activating topics. So then this, and it's very important to do this y'all. Humility is, it's a beautiful thing. And the ability to apologize is just really demonstrates a lot of humility and strength in my opinion. So I really encourage you to be very overt about this taking responsibility for the client's overactivation. So again, you, the, you may very well, there's a possibility here. So this is where you're just constantly taking the temperature, right? Because so if you, if you think, and we've talked about this before of clients who have more of a others focus. So if you're like super excited about the activation and like, you're super excited for them to make progress, which is valid. Um, you might get a client that's going to like do that just to like go with you to kind of please you. Um, and you have very little control over that. So I'm not saying like, you know, there's nothing you can do, but at the same time, like if that's a tendency of the client, that might be something where you make this error and then you remediate it. But just, just saying like having excitement and like wanting to work with the client and stuff, those are important, like beautiful things. Um, but you just also never know how the client's going to interpret that. And I'm, and again, I'm not saying don't do it because I think it's important. Um, I'm just saying like to be prepared for possibilities. So you want to take responsibility for their overactivation while not disparaging like your own work or your abilities. Um, you know, I, I take responsibility for this. I should have known that it was too much. Like, don't do that shit. Um, and yeah, so you're taking responsibility for it and then moving on. Um, like it almost, uh, it, it's like what's coming to mind right now. So some, if somebody is like, oh my gosh, Sarah, that was a terrible like analogy to make or comparison to make. Like, I imagine it's almost like, um, it could be like getting somebody's like pronouns wrong and then like fixing it. And then just like, Oh, like just apologizing for days about it. Like, okay, just take responsibility and move on. Um, so same thing here, just, okay. I, you know, that's on me. Um, we're going to take a step back, um, and, and, you know, kind of re, uh, calibrate here and then we'll move forward. So it doesn't have to be like this super long conversation about it. You don't need to get like forgiveness from your client or anything like that. Um, you shouldn't expect that. So I just want to highlight that probably talking a little bit to myself too, because I know that's, um, something that I constantly work on is like, I don't, <laughs> I don't have to get, the client to say it's okay <laughs> um because then that's really me like it that's to me that would be like an abuse of power in the room of 
expecting that are trying to coax that out of the client. So then you are supporting and validating their expression of distress. So including suggesting that emotional reactivity is indicative of good work as opposed to like engaging in avoidance. So saying like, you know, this, this is good, this is progress. Um, and then discussing and reframing any major activation after it occurs. So these are all things that you can do like in order, you might not need to do all of them, but these are all things to keep in mind. So discussing and reframing the major activ activation after it occurs. So the client understands their reactions as a normal reaction to the power of that triggering memory, and it doesn't pathologize them. So if some of those narratives do come out, some of so those like self-disparaging um, things, you're going to give that space and then you're going to process. So then you can problem solve with the client. So you wanna problem solve with them in a way that you detect the client's escalating distress. So this is really relevant if the client habitually uses emotional avoidance defenses. Um, so when you are seeing it, because they may not be cued in, your client may not have the connection to their emotional experience to know when they're starting to become um, escalated and then the avoidance is automatic. So you'll start to get some cues from them when they start to like space out or you're like seeing them kind of like, you know, emotionally go someplace else. Um, so that's when you can start to reel them back and help them become more aware of their emotional state. So then you're problem solving with them so that the client can communicate distress at any time that it occurs and that you and the client work to bring the activation level back down to within the therapeutic window. So very collaborative experience. I see you, um, what's going on? Okay, client, you've had many repetitions with this. We're creating a safe space. Um, now talk to me. And then together, we're gonna figure out how we can keep our work within the therapeutic window. And then you want to make non-defensive support. So again, you, you've made an error, right? You've pushed a little bit too hard. You misread the situation. That's okay. It happens. Like there are so many opportunities for reparative experiences within therapy. You will not be perfect. You will make mistakes. Um, that does not make you a bad therapist. Um, you know, that's an opportunity for growth, just like anything. Just think, think of us as therapists, as any skill that you've learned to do play a sport, play an instrument, learn a skill, whatever it is. Um, you've made tons of mistakes along the way. Um, this is no different. Uh, like, yes, the stakes feel higher because it's humans. Um, as long as you're not doing it. So that's why we have ethical guidelines too. Like as long as you're not out there sleeping with your clients and you are not, you know, overtly, trying to cause harm, <laughs> you're doing fine. Um, so just know mistakes are, are expected, they're inevitable. Um, and the hope is that you create a space with your client where they can tell you that. Um, that to me is the indicator of the safest space that you can create is when a client says, hey, you know, when you did that, I didn't like that. It's like, great, look what we've created together. Um, and it's all, I always uh, attend to that with a thank you so much for sharing. That's really important for me to know. Um, in like a very warm way, I feel the way I said it just was kind of callous just now. <laughs> it was very like kind of crass, but I don't, I don't normally do it like that. So then you want to make these non-defensive supportive and validating statements that convey, convey, convey a cautious optimism about this emotional roller coaster. So again, it's, you're normalizing it. And you're saying, you know, early on in this process, this is to be expected. Um, and we're going to work together to figure out where that sweet spot is. Um, overactivation can happen. Um, and I really don't want you guys to think that it's, you know, a failure on your part. It's something to acknowledge, something to remediate, and something to do differently moving forward. Okay, so then there's this concept of disparity. So disparity between what the client is feeling and the current state of their reality. So if they're feeling activated fear associated with a trauma memory, the hope is that the current state of their reality is there's this absence of immediate danger. And, they, and you wanna acknowledge this. So there's a disparity. So when you're thinking about if when they're when they were in this trauma experience, their feeling and their current reality completely aligned. 
now when they're react when they're reliving this when we're they're re-experiencing these emotions and these memories those emotions are going to align with the memory right but then their current state is not the same so that's where you want to continue to um create and um create the disparity and and acknowledge and highlight this disparity. So for conditioned emotional responses to traumatic memories to be diminished or extinguished over time, you have to consistently reinforce um, that there is not danger in their current environment. Um, yeah, so you are consistently reinforcing them that that doesn't exist, or you must consistently not be reinforced. A client must not be reinforced by similar danger in the current environment. So that's the disparity in the therapeutic space. You are safe. And then the hope is that, you know, in phase one, you've established that their current environment outside of the therapeutic space is also not unsafe. So the trauma in which the uh, or the environment in which the trauma activation occurs must reliably not reinforce the original danger or fear association, danger, fear association. So again, safe space. Um, and you're also, so this is something that you're also assessing for consistently outside of the space. So you know that you're doing your best to create a very safe space within the therapeutic space. That's what you have control over. And then you want to also assess how are your living conditions? How are your family dynamics? What's going on in your life right now? Are you feeling safe? So in order to manifest this safety, to help create this disparity within the room, um, the client should have the opportunity to realize that they're safe with you in your presence. Um, that takes consistency. Again, it's a lot more than lip service. They've been given lip service before and it hasn't worked out. Um, so it's about saying it and then being consistent with it and recognizing that that might take time. And then the safety and treatment includes protection from overwhelming in an overwhelming internal experience. So that's where you're working within the therapeutic window. So then counter conditioning, uh, this is the presence of positive phenomenon that are antithetic to um, physical or psychological danger. Uh, so uh, counter conditioning can be the experience of an emotional release and crying or other forms. So this is something where like if they were to cry maybe before they would get hurt right? Crying was an invitation to abuse. Um, crying was an invitation to ridicule. Crying was an invitation to dismiss, to invalidate, to shame. Um, so crying or other forms of emotional expression in response to upsetting events typically produces relatively positive emotional states. So when somebody is able to cry in a supportive environment, in a validating environment, that brings about some release. Um, my guess would be that many of the clients that you will see who have experienced trauma um, would cry in isolation, um, would uh, cry in, you know, in silence, meaning, you know, you know, it's like somebody like whimpers, they're trying not to like, they're overwhelmed, crying is happening, but they're doing their best to like push it down. So um, crying and other forms of emotional expression can counter condition the fear and related effects initially associated with the traumatic event or the traumatic memory. So just allowing space for that, um, it won't necessarily be a catharsis, but for that emotion to just come out and be, and, and to be met with empathy and to be met with kindness and compassion. So, at, even though we know these things that like this, you know, congruent emotional, like if I'm experiencing something and then I emote congruent with that experience, that's a good healing thing because I'm, I am in touch with that and I'm able to express it in a space that's validating. Um, and so even though we know that that's a good thing, we don't want to push for any sort of emotional expression when the client may be not at a place that they're willing to engage in that. Um, but if it does occur, we should support it. So like, you're not going in and saying, you know, crying is very important. What I, like my goal for you is for you to cry during session. Um, I know a lot of therapists kind of joke about that is, you know, like, I know I've done a good job when my client cries or something like that. Um, it's, it's a, it's a flip, it's a 
flip expression. Um, and it is meant to be a joke. There is some seriousness to it, um, but it's not something that should be like on our agenda. All right, so then the last component is desensitization and resolution. So this is the process of remembering painful, but not overwhelming events while they're, the client is feeling safe. When they have a, po so positive relatedness is to not only us, but hopefully that expands outside of the room. We can control what's in the room, but they have a positive relationship with us. They feel seen, we mirror them, we validate them, we provide this space while also, you know, offering an opportunity to have some discomfort, to have activation while knowing that it's not exploitative, they're not going to be betrayed, uh, they're not going to be coerced, they're, you know, bad things are not going to happen to them. So uh, the ability to emotionally express, they, there's safety in crying, you know, you're going to get a lot of clients that, oh my God, I'm so sorry, I'm crying. And then you say, this is a space for it. Like, you're okay. Um, allow them to just do that. And then maybe have a process of like, you know, what is, uh, you know, I noticed that you apologized when you did that. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, you don't have to do that. Sometimes it's okay to just like, let them be, and then not really, you know, make a whole deal of it. And then you're, they're also in the process of desensitization re resolution. They're at a space where they're minimally avoiding anything. Um, and so this can, all of these elements serve to break the connection between these traumatic memories and the associated negative emotional response. So when I'm able to express, um, when I'm able to tell my story, when I'm able to, to go back into a traumatic memory and not be so overwhelmed that I dissociate, when I'm able to emotionally express, when I feel like I can talk to my therapist and be validated and be met with empathy and be encouraged, um, be reinforced, you know, these are all things that allow for, because you're essentially reconditioning, right? This is what some of that counter conditioning is of, I should be ashamed. So when I have this emotional, this traumatic memory and any sort of associated emotions, um, I should feel shame. I, I should feel, you know, these negative things. What we're doing is doing that counter conditioning of, you know, as you emote, this is, this is healing. This is progress. This is beautiful. You're doing great. Stick with it. I'm here with you. You are safe. Those types of things that creates a gap, right? So where these things, they were just automatic. I have this memory. I'm automatically in this emotional space. I have this memory automatically in this emotional space. What we're doing is we're breaking the connection between these two through things like disparity, counter conditioning, activation, exposure, and desensitization and resolution. So then we talked a little bit about hot spots last week. Um, so you want hot spots are essentially like the things that really are activating. Um, they create quite a response in the client. So it says here, don't exceed over 20 minutes. Don't exceed 20 minutes in duration when you're processing hotspots. And again, I'll get to the nitty gritty of some of the timing doing this. So again, when you're processing hotspots, you want to first thoroughly explain the procedure and gain consent. If the client is not willing to do it, don't do it. You always want to honor their wishes with this. So then you encourage the client to become as relaxed as possible. You can do some relaxation techniques right in session. And then if the client is able to, you're going to ask them to close their eyes. If they're not able to, no big deal. Maybe you can have them like look at an area um, to just like kind of concentrate and then up, describe the upsetting memory slowly in detail and then using present tense. So again, you know, the, the car is coming at me um, I am very scared. I'm frozen. I want to, I know I need to jump toward the ditch and I didn't, and I'm not doing that. Um, so it's all present tense. And then you're encouraging any emotional expression whenever it emerges. I am scared. I want to scream, um, go ahead and scream. Um, you know, just whatever comes to them, you're encouraging that. And then you can interrupt them um, to have them go back to something, stay in something, um, return to the present tense, things like that. 
Um, also, when somebody's becoming very activated, you can interrupt them and then reorient them to the here and now, um, meaning you can, uh, so again, if somebody is uh, moving away from present tense in their story, um, you want to reorient them there. At the same time, if they are becoming very activated, you're noticing that you're potentially overshooting the therapeutic window, you can orient, you can pause them and orient them to their, the safety of here and now. Take a deep breath, reorient, relax. If you need to pause it, um, return to it later, or if they just need a second um, to gather themselves and then go back into the experience. And then you repeat these steps over and over for as many sessions as you need. So emotional processing and substance dependence. We, we talked about this a little bit last week with when we talked about safety seeking, that approach that's very specific to working with uh, co-occurring substance use and like PTSD or trauma. So usually what is suggested if somebody is using um, substance use, it, substances, using substance use, using substances is to first treat the chemical dependency and then allow for some abstinence to occur, hoping, you know, some abstinence occurs and then have the trauma, then treat the trauma related symptoms. So the hope is, or the, th not the hope, the thought behind this. So again, this is one approach that you, you may or may not ascribe to, um, where you, the thought is if a client is currently using substances, probably as a means of avoidance, right? Um, that trauma processing can't really happen until they no longer have the, their like vehicle of avoidance. Okay. So, I mean, that makes logical sense. So the rationale for this is that premature exposure to trauma memories may intensify any sort of substance use. It can trigger a relapse and then otherwise challenge the diminishing affect regulation capacities. So if, if we're doing trauma exposure and it becomes overwhelming, that client may really lean back into substances. They can potentially, you know, have, um, experience a relapse where it's a, you know, return to use, Potent, there's the potential for their use to increase. And then any sort of affect regulation training that you've done or skill building that you've done um, really doesn't work. It doesn't go anywhere um, because really what it potentially does is says these skills aren't effective. Like this is the only thing that's effective is my substance use. So at the same time, so here's, that's the rationale, but there is no consensus nor much empirical evidence to support this position. So the uh, um, authors of this book suggest modifications to any like PTSD um, substance use disorder treatment. Um, so there is a possibility where you treat them concurrently, uh, where the, another rationale is as we work through this trauma processing, you know, maybe the substance use continues, but as we're building skills, as we're building, um, hopefully tolerance for this, then the substance use becomes less needed. Um, because we're attending to probably, you know, the driving source for the substance use. So just whatever, either of those, whatever makes sense to you, there's not, you know, uh, one's not better than the other. It just really depends on really your worldview in terms of that, your approach, your beliefs. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on that? Like the, either the sequential, you know, treating the substance use and then the trauma or the treating them concurrently. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Or I mean, maybe even some experience with it, whether that's something that you've talked about at your clinic site. Um, just curious about any thoughts on that. I have a thought, um, I mean, just experience, I guess I worked in um, substance abuse treatment for a while and 
Yeah, I feel like in a lot of like the groups we did and discussions, it seemed like it was treated concurrently because it just kind of, I don't know. I just feel like it's not like a linear process, you know, like substance use comes up maybe more prevalently that day or in conversation. And then sometimes the trauma is triggered. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if that like helps add to the conversation, but yeah, it makes sense to me too. Cause you know, if you're thinking of, you know, you're not really potentially, if you, if you choose to do it sequentially, which again, not, not, it's not wrong. There's just not evidence to show that that's the way to do it. Um, is that if you have a, um, if you're using substances to potentially cope with a trauma. So you're asking, you're not processing the trauma. You're saying, we'll hold that, but you can't, you can no longer do this thing that has been very consistent and, and dependable and like helpful for you and destructive in many ways, but also helpful in many ways. Um, but we won't do any of this. We won't attend to any of kind of the core driving stuff until you can stop doing this thing, which I mean, again, you can probably hear how I'm talking about it, like my preference for it. But um, again, it doesn't, (laughs) that's just my personal preference. That's not the right way. Um, So Paige, thank you so much for, for adding that. Any other thoughts? All right, we'll keep rocking. We're almost there. Okay, so here, I've been alluding to this a lot in our, (laughs) in the PowerPoint so far. So here I'll break down um, that bell curve, that standard bell curve that I was talking about. So in those opening minutes, you want to like, again, very standard, but with this asking, you know, how is the last, how has it been since I've seen you last? Um, And then here is some of the trauma specific stuff. Have there been any new traumas have you engaged in any self-destructive behaviors? Um, if any of the foregoing is a concern, you want to work to assure and increase the client's ongoing physical safety. So you do this before you move on to any trauma processing. Then you want to check in uh, with the client regarding their internal experience since the last session. You know, has anything come up for you? Um, you know, did you were did anything affect you throughout the week that maybe we talked about in session? normalizing that and validating those feelings of, you know, as we go through some of this, uh, you know, telling of the story and re-experiencing, it's very normal to have these responses, you know, let's figure out a way to keep you safe. So that's in the first five to 10 minutes. And then that mid-session is where you really, you know, pump up the intensity. So you're providing them emotional and cognitive memory processing, staying within the therapeutic window as you can. Um, And then if any of that is contraindicated, you're going to go back to psychoeducation, some general discussion, a focus on less upsetting events. So this should last between 20 and 30 minutes. And then later on in the session, so again, as you're, so in mid-session, you've peaked in terms of intensity. Now, as you go in that later session, the goal is to bring that intensity down so you can leave the client or you can have the client leave feeling some sense of stability. So you're gonna debrief, normalize and validate whatever happened in the processing. So these are things where when you're in the processing stage, you wanna be very aware of time Um, because this coming down, and I'm sure those of you who are in clinical practice right now, you've experienced this, where things stayed intense for a, like a little bit longer than you thought, or you were like really in it, kind of weren't necessarily paying attention to time because you were, you know, really invested and engrossed in the conversation. And all of a sudden you've got three minutes left of session. Um, you've got somebody like crying in your office. So this is where it's, it's okay to temper, meaning, um, like you're not shutting somebody's experience down, but you're also letting them know, you know, our time, we're getting to a place where we're going to start to, you know, wrap up. We're going to start to deescalate here. We're going to move into some relaxation stuff. Um, let's debrief and talk about what we were just experiencing. So this is, it's a skill. Um, there, there is a bit of a natural, um, 
curve that happens in session, but we really have to stay on top of it as well. So here in these last 15 to 25 minutes, you're inquiring about the client's experience during the processing, any thoughts they had while it was occurring. You're providing some cognitive therapy. So, you know, giving them any feedback on cognitive distortions that you may have heard um, or maybe ask them about any, you know, um, distortions. So because you've educated them about this already, um, seemingly before you get to the processing, right? So they should know what a cognitive distortion is. They should have some psychoeducation on that. So then you're inviting them to maybe talk about any that they may have heard. And if their activation remains high, you're going to work to deescalate them. So again, this is increasing a focus on those non-emotional issues um, grounding techniques. So these are things that you might employ similar things as you would like a client in crisis. They may not be in crisis, but the, again, the purpose of grounding is to deescalate. So you're going to provide them with some relaxation, grounding, deescalation um, activities. And then the ending here. So you want to always, so I think this first piece is so important of reminding them of any potential delayed effects of trauma processing. Like just because you walk out this door doesn't mean you get like this kind of blank slate until next week. Um, so they may have it, an uptick in flashbacks, nightmares, a desire to engage in avoidance activities. So this is where you, you're cognizant of this and you prepare your client for this. So again, this is at, like after that initial session before you're even, or, you know, first, second, third session before you begin the cognitive processing, because, you know, in phase one, you're establishing safety. Um, but before you move to this, you are letting them know all of these things. This doesn't happen, you know, you don't do the processing and go, oh, and by the way, <laughs> you may experience these things because it will take you longer than five to 10 minutes to offer them and, and supply them with some safety um, skills. So you're, you're creating a safety plan for them. If these things happen, what can I engage in? Who can I, who can I interact with? Um, what's what resources do I have um, to help keep me safe? Um, so safety planning regarding dangers identified in session, but safety planning doesn't have to be just for like suicidal or homicidal ideation. It can be for things like, you know, if I experience a flashback, if I experience a nightmare, what are some skills that I can employ to, um, like have a sense of control over these things or to at least decrease the residual effects of these. You're gonna provide a closing statement. So you're gonna sum up what you did in session. You're also gonna say very encouraging words. We did great work. I was really, um, you know, I saw this thing happen that we've been working on. That's really great. You can even ask the client. I, I would also always encourage you all to include feedback into this process. Um, how did we do today? Um, what did you, what did you think went, uh, particularly well today? Did anything happen today that you wish would have gone a little bit differently? Did I do or say anything in session that really didn't, um, sit well with you? So just, again, it's in encouraging this co-creation of the session. And then you're going to obviously, maybe not obviously, but then you're going to refer to the time and date of the next session. So that's what you do at the end. Okay, so finally getting to the Herman text of remembrance and mourning. So this is focused a lot on narrative, right? So we've done cognitive, emotional, we've touched a little bit on narrative, we're gonna to touch a little bit more. Um, so reconstructing the story really is a um, opportunity to do a lot of the things that we've already alluded to of making, of understanding any sort of internal messaging, you know, internalized emotional um, experiences, internal cognitive experiences. So you're reviewing their life before the trauma. So the thing with narrative is that you're looking at the whole person. Um, so again, this mourning and remembrance can be of the person I was or who I thought I was prior to the trauma. So your understand their story begins as early as you can get, a, get them to go. 
Um, so a narrative that does not include the traumatic imagery and bodily sensation, unfortunately, is incomplete. So there has to be a point where that becomes part of the narrative, that that is incorporated, integrated into, um, into the story. So it's not enough for us to be just neutral or non-judgmental. So one thing actually I'll pull from another class that I'm teaching. Um, I don't know how many of you are um, familiar with contextual family therapy, but one of the positions of contextual family therapy is um, multi-directional partiality. So, you know, we talk about being impartial in our stance, right? So neutral basically means how, how, how we've come to understand neutrality in our field is like maintaining some emotional distance from the experience, right? So we're modeling um, calmness and empathy and um, the ability to like not be super activated, not be triangulated, that kind of stuff in um, when working with systems. Uh, so one of the drawbacks of neutrality is it can feel cold. Like I'm, I'm neutral because I don't really care. Um, and that's, uh, that's not a good place to be, particularly when you're working with somebody who has been traumatized. So anyway, I just wanted to introduce to you, this may make no sense or may not resonate with you at all, but the idea of multi-directional partiality, meaning that you are leaning into and validating each person's perspective. So you're, you're kind of, uh, on, in a way you're like siding momentarily siding with everybody. So, um, I think this is a little bit easier to do when you're working with an individual because they're the only story that you get, right. They're the only perspective that you get. Um, but you may be working with a couple where somebody's experienced a trauma or a family where somebody's experienced a trauma. Um, and you want to like encourage and um, affirm their position while also like when the next person talks that you're affirming and encouraging their position as well. So that um, sometimes the stance of neutrality feels a little bit too cold. So if, if that does for you, um, there's other like approaches that really are very similar to the construct or the concept of neutrality, um, but it, it's a little bit more emotionally driven. So um, just thinking of neutrality, like when it was created or when it was coined um, and who the people were. So it's, you know, men in the 1950s and 60s um, who believed that that was the best approach to take. And that may not be the, what makes sense to you. So just wanted to give a little bit of a different perspective on that. So you're not just being neutral, non-judgmental, you know, providing uh, multi-directional partiality, but you're provide, um, you're also encouraging, you're um, being compassionate, you're being empathetic, uh, you're being warm, you're being supportive. Um, so there's all these elements. The Another thing to remember is um, you aren't, you don't want to provide any like ready-made answers. So again, this is, this goes back to the slide we talked about where, you know, you may have very good intentions and the client may provide you with some like existential questions, um, or, you know, a, a very difficult question that nobody can answer, but them, and they need some time to process it. Um, but, so you don't want to provide these really quick answers. One, because it may be received by the client as, oh my God, they, they came up with that answer so quick. Like, how am I so stupid to not have known that already? You know, I'm, I'm so far behind the therapist kind of a thing. Um, so you also want to, one of the things that we um, model in this work is a comfort with ambiguity, a comfort with not knowing. Um, we've talked about that before. Um, so you, rather than providing a ready-made answer, you affirm a position of moral solidarity with the client that you're working with. You know, I'm with you on this. We're going to get through this together. Um, cause it might be a question like, why, why did they do this to me? Or how could I have been so naive to trust this person or something like that? Um, 
uh, you know, why am I having such a difficult time processing this? Why can't I remember more details of what happened? Um, that's not where you're, you know, going into the neurobiology of it or anything that might be something. Um, but it, it probably wouldn't be like a direct answer to them. It's something that you're, you know, we're going to get through this. It could be a, here's what we know. Um, but anyway, the, usually the reason for a ready-made answer to the client is because you're feeling anxious. So before you want to soothe something for the client, really ask yourself, like, am I just trying to soothe myself by providing an answer? And if, if you're being honest with yourself and that's the reason, please don't do it. Okay. So transforming a traumatic memory. So the client may be reluctant to give up symptoms, um, because they've acquired some kind of meaning to them. Um, so th this is also, I, I wanted to highlight this to share the many, many possibilities as to why these things might be happening. Um, so they may have acquired meaning. So if the client is having trouble accessing a memory also, so these are, if, if they're having difficulty giving them up, um, this might be a reason. Also, what you might find, because many times, you know, we're asking the client go back to the memory, you know, talk about it in as much detail as you can. Sometimes the client just isn't able to do that. So if they are having trouble with that, you can use some of your client's daily experiences and they can be, they can have lots of clues to help, um, identify some of the potentially dissociated past memory. So if you have a client that's like, I can't remember anything, I can't remember anything, go ahead and go to their present. Um, talk to me about like a recent time where maybe you had some difficulty or tell me about your daily routine or something like that, that can be an in or, you know, like a, a beginning to processing some of those more dissociated or repressed memories. So traumatic loss. The client, I mentioned this earlier, that you might have a client that refuses to grieve because to them, it would be a victory for the perpetrator. If I grieve this, then, then they win because they've affected me. So in this case, we know that grief and mourning is a very important process or piece of this process. So if you can, um, and it may take time where the client just says, no, I'm not doing, this is like the one thing that I have control over and I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to let them win. Um, so it may take some time to get a client in a place where they say I'm ready. Um, so trying to reframe that as an act of courage rather than one of humiliation and also letting them know that if you're unable to grieve, then you're cut off from a part of yourself and you're, you're robbing yourself of an important part of your healing. So it may sound harsh, um, but it's, it's the truth. So whatever, you know, whatever way that it makes most sense for you to share that, but really it's them holding themselves back because of a belief that they have around grief and what that would mean for the perpetrator and what it would mean for them. Cause it would essentially be admitting defeat in their eyes, which um, is valid. It also is holding them back. Um, so really the only way that you can discover your resilience and your um, inner strength is to mourn what, what the client has lost. And then, um, mourning is difficult. So there, a resistance to mourning or a hesitancy, um, is the most common place for stagnation in the second stage of recovery. So in phase two, um, because in phase three, you're consolidating all of this stuff, right? You're, um, integrating it into their everyday life, but just to know, like, and this would be something to normalize with the client. Like this is the most common place where people get, um, a little bit hung up. They, they have a difficult time, um, doing this. That's okay. We'll take our time here. And then last but not least, before we take our last break of the day, um, is these, the disguises in this resistance to doing it, or, um, again, I don't, I just like generally don't like the term resistance in, um, therapy, but like a hesitation, a desire to not do it. Um, so clients think 
that they can. So instead they're like, no, I, there's other ways that I can heal besides mourning. Like, I'm not going to grieve. I'm going to do one of these three things and then I'll be okay. So they think that they can get some, again, so the, this is where you allow space for them to talk about it. Okay. Um, if, if this is not something you want to do, um, how do you think, like, what would be your best approach to healing? And likely what you're going to hear is one of these three things is revenge. So, you know, they may harm the perpetrator or, you know, it's like an, a desire to get back and like, kind of like balance the ledger of balance. Yeah. Balance the ledger of their, um, that's, that's off kilter where they're, they're at a disadvantage. If I can do something to like get some power or show some strength, um, then everything will be okay. And then I won't be feeling so bad because it's now I'm even forgiveness where they just give like blanket forgiveness, um, without really processing of, you know, I've forgiven this person for hurting me, for hurting my family, you know, whatever happened. Um, and that's the way that I'm just going to move forward with this. But one of the risks in this is there's uh, not a true processing of how they're actually affected. And they may, they may be denying some of their very real emotions um, just for the sake of trying to like get over this as quickly as possible. And then the last is compensation. This doesn't necessarily mean um, monetary compensation. It can be like compensation in the form of like the justice system, as we know, it doesn't happen very often. Um, so it, these are just ways, again, of like evening the score, trying to even the score. And then what we will highlight to our clients is as you're mourning, you have to come to terms with the impossibility of getting even. It's it's not a realistic goal. It's not going to happen. Like even if, for example, um, you know, you were to harm your perpetrator in the way that they harmed you, when this has happened, when clients have done this, they usually feel worse. It compounds their shame. It compounds their guilt because it was something that they wanted in, the, like they really believed if I can hurt you or your loved one or something in the way that you hurt me, it's going to be this immediate release or relief. And it usually isn't, it very rarely is if ever. Um, so just, you know, it's okay to, to talk to your clients about some of the risks in their approach with this. Okay, so I'll go ahead and stop the share here. Um, about 30, 25 ish minutes of lecture here. Um, so we only have two more weeks of content and then we've got two weeks for presentations and wrap up and stuff like that. So um, no worries if we don't get through everything here. Like I said, I wanna make sure that what we cover um, right now, we give, um, like appropriate time to, so I do have a very, a question that all I want is an honest answer. How many of you were able to read this week's stuff? Okay, so Anna, <laughs> that's okay. Um, so I, um, all right, that, that just kind of dictates how I'm gonna ask this question. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over some of the material and then prior to us doing our uh, relaxation technique, I do want all of you to engage in a little bit of conversation with each other. I'll put you in breakout rooms, um, just around your level of comfort of bringing up some of the things that we'll be talking about in class today. Um, so I think it's really important for us to understand where we're at in terms of our comfort, our hesitancy, um, because it's, uh, basically these are like issues of marginalization, oppression, discrimination, um, that we are taught about in classes, but we're ne not necessarily taught about how to weave them into our therapy. I don't, that might be a different experience because I'm not fully, I don't know all of the curriculum front and back at Alliant yet. So maybe this is something maybe in your diversity class that you do, um, do a little bit more of, but anyway, just wanting to preface some of this with, uh, um, discussion on this. So basically what I want 
after we cover some of this, I want to spend a little bit of time putting you in breakout rooms to just discuss with your fellow classmates your level of comfort or potential hesitancy um, or both um, with talking about larger systemic issues of oppression, marginalization, discrimination, prejudice that uh, permeate the walls of the room um, and the and your client's lived experience. All right, so let's get to this week's stuff. So it's going to be all brand new information for all of you. Um, so really, some of the um, topics that are covered in this are specific to race, specific to um, sexual orientation or sexual attraction, um, ethno violence. Um, so these may be some new uh, concepts for you. Um, but like I said, please please make time to read these. These are incredibly important. Um, so Kenneth Hardy at uh, Drexel, he actually, if you um, ever go on psychotherapy.net, he has a couple of like videos on there of his uh, therapeutic approach. So he wrote an article and we read this week or you will read on healing the hidden wounds of racial trauma. So really the 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 basis of this reading was to highlight some of the ways in which we pathologize people for having very understandable reactions to things like microaggressions, things like an experience of not having their voice heard or being validated and how we might pathologize that. Um, so in terms of race-related trauma wounds, uh, one of the things that I very much agree with what Dr. Hardy talks about in this article is how we don't, we don't really talk about this. Kind, we don't really make space um, for these conversations around. So this is specific to race-related trauma wounds. So we don't really make space in the therapeutic room to talk about these wounds um, and these potentially very consistent or at, at the very least, even if they're inconsistent, these really distressing experiences. So how we're taught, particularly uh, Dr. Hardy's also an MFT, um, is we attend to issues of the family, you know, individual psychological issues, maybe behavioral problems, affect disorders, substance misuse, um, but we really don't make space for the larger um, like messaging and cultural experiences of people. So when you're working with particularly um, youth, so this, this um, article focuses on adolescents in particular um, of color who have potentially experienced um, microaggressions, marginalization, um, traumas based on their race that we really need to make space to address this, understand it. Um, because if we're focusing just on things within the family, in, within the individual, focusing on behavior or affect, that we might be missing some of the more like deep, honest experiences that inform some of the behaviors that we're seeing. So there's the, he talks about the concept of internalized devalu devaluation, which is a byproduct of racism and it's inextricably linked to the deification. So the um, godly like deity of whiteness and the demonization of any non-white hues. Um, so it's a pervasive message that um, is very much informed by white supremacy and colonization that um, no one is immune to. Uh, everybody suffers with this, um, with, with this um, belief system. So this is perpetuated by society and this is within every system. Um, in any institutions that a person is in contact with, as we know, higher education is an institution, education in general is an institution. Um, this is also things like religious institutions or criminal justice system, that's an institution. Um, so this internalized devalu devaluation permeates all of this. Um, so again, while treatment protocols are generally 
um, designed to address family dynamics, there's really no um, attention that's given to these underlying racial wounds. So again, this, this messaging of you are less than, or there's, there's an inherent value difference based on your skin color um, that we, that aren't, that isn't involved in or isn't included in our treatment manuals. Um, so there's also the concept of the assaulted sense of self. Um, it, and that's this consistent uh, messages of devaluing um, of, of individuals, again, focusing based on race here. Um, and so it becomes, if it's, if it's so consistent that it becomes an internalized message. Now, one thing that I do wanna say moving forward with content like this is it absolutely is doing a disservice to our clients if we don't allow space for them to talk about their identity and aspects of their identity that absolutely influence the way that they navigate the world, the way that they are received and perceived by the world and the way that they internalize any sort of messaging around their identity. It is also a disservice to assume that based on a client's, uh, you know, having one of their identities be a, a marginalized status, that it is they inherently um, are traumatized by that. So I, it's, it's a balance of validating, creating space, but not working with the assumption that, oh, you must have an inherently hard life because of X, Y, Z part of your identity. So that's a thing that I want to just balance here of if we don't talk about it in session um, and we make assumptions of that person based on any part of their identity, we're doing nothing different than what the world does to them. Um, same as, you know, if you have a uh, white man, cisgender, uh, heterosexual, assuming that their life is pretty easy, um, it's, it's no different than doing that, than kind of dismissing any sort of struggle that might be happening if you have multiple, like, um, dom uh, majority identities. Um, so that, I just wanted to say that um, so that we give space to it because it's important at the same time, not make assumptions. And let's say that you provide a space. So it's because we are inherently in a position of power and authority in that room, we give permission and we broach the topic. Um, so it is something important for us to recognize within ourselves um, that we do have power in that and that we do have um, you know, biases and stereotypes and blind spots and all of these things that inform who we are. And that's one of the beautiful things about self of the therapist work is you continue to uncover that and have humility while doing it. Um, but I, I say all this because if you mention it and say, hey, you know, there's, you know, we have all of these different aspects of our identity. Um, is there anything that you've experienced based on any of your, you know, pieces of your identity and the clients like, nope, um, not to push it <laughs> because it, it can either be, they really don't experience it. They don't see it that way. Two, they don't trust you to talk about it. Three, they're not ready to talk about it. So there's lots of options here in terms of what might be going on. If you broach the topic and the client says, nope, I'm good. Not going to go there. So there's also the, the con concept of internalized voicelessness or the experience of internalized voicelessness. So again, these aren't things that are you know, globally experienced by every person who um, has a, that you know, doesn't benefit from white supremacy. Um, but it, so the concept here is that internalized voicelessness er erodes one's ability to defend themselves against a barrage or consistent messaging that's unwelcomed, unjustified, unjustifiably negative, and these potentially debilitating messages. Um, so you know the inability to talk and to talk about it. Um, we taught we I think we alluded to this maybe a couple of weeks ago in class of Dr. Sue Wing's um, concept of microaggressions and the catch 22 in that of, so if somebody experiences a microaggression, 
they essentially have two choices. <laughs> they can do nothing or they can say something. Um, and either way, uh, they're caught in what's called a catch 22, because if I say something, then I'm overreacting. I misheard. I didn't mean it that way. Um, you know, something's wrong with the receiver about this. You're overreacting. You're misunderstanding me. Or if I say nothing, then I have to sit in this discomfort or this frustration, this anger, um, while the other person is oblivious to that. Um, so this, it, that's a component of this internalized voicelessness of kind of this like potential no win situation. If I do choose to say something, cause I won't be met with, um, validity or compassion. So then, uh, Dr. Hardy talks about the wound of rage. So it's impossible to experience all of these, uh, negative debilitating messages around your sense of self without experiencing some anger and rage. So this rage can build up over time. And if you continue to suppress this, um, and so this rage builds up, but it can be suppressed by the sense of voicelessness. So I have nowhere to go with this rage, nothing, no one to talk to about it. Um, maybe feeling as though people don't understand. And then this rage is distinguishable from anger um, because the anger is connected to an immediate experience, whereas rage is more residual. So it can just be something that it kind of hangs around. And so Dr. Hardy defines rage as a complex emotion that can appear as anger, explosiveness, sadness, and depression. So there's a lot of elements that can be um, informing this or kind of coupled with this. And uh, he states that youth of, youth of color are often prescribed anger management interventions while this underlying experience of rage as a hidden wound um, remains unaddressed. So that's, that's what I was talking about earlier of this kind of like pathologizing something that makes sense in context if you get, if you actually have a conversation about it. Um, so there's lots of research on like the disproportionate, um, um, requiring of, or enrolling adolescent, like youth in, um, youth of color in anger management, um, interventions. And so it's then what happens, there's a messaging around like anger is, is common in this population and things like that. So um, it becomes almost politicized in a way because there's some mis misinformation that is due to a misunderstanding um, and a lack of um, a lack of understanding of a very important element or something that's that an element that exists within our society that just isn't talked about. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop this um, presentation. So a lot of what we're covering to, for this week um, has to do with essentially um, marginalized identities and how we can attend to that in session and the risks and the um, like harms and potential like you know, misdirection that we take if we don't create space for that. Um, so what I wanted to do was give you guys a, a cue to talk about with one another um, for like seven-ish minutes. Um, hopefully that'll give some time. I'll put you in smaller groups to give you a chance to chat about, you know, talking about these larger societal um, influences on humans and what you think like your level of comfort would be with that, maybe potentially having um, certain pieces of one's identity maybe be more comfortable for you to talk about than another, like what kind of um, aspects would be existing within the space that would create comfort or would create some hesitancy around this. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? It's like under, okay, cool. So I'm gonna go ahead and make some breakout rooms for us. We'll go three or four people. So we'll come back together at about 1235. 
um, chat a little bit about it, and then we'll go into our transcendental relaxation or transcendental meditation. A couple things that brought up. Um, okay. Stephanie was talking first about how her supervisor has told her something like, and Stephanie, feel free to interrupt me and correct me. Um, something like, if the client doesn't bring something up, then we shouldn't kind of talk mm. about it. Oh, uh, Stephanie, I'm so sorry, but I very much disagree. And so we talked about that a little bit and how you know the client may not even know that it's part of the presenting problem. And that's part of the reason they're in therapy is to kind mm. of explore and analyze these different influences and, and roots of these issues. Um, and also it may be something on their mind that they don't feel safe to talk about because we may be a different culture or, or um, ethnicity or religion or sure, all of sure. that. Um, so by opening that door, it can create that sense of safety um, to allow them and give them permission to talk about it that they may not have thought they had originally. Yeah, so that, um, thank you so much for sharing, Miles. And if it's okay, Stephanie, I'm gonna to speak to this for um, just a second. Cause I, I do think that that message that your supervisor gave you, and I don't, I don't mean to undermine, this really is a different perspective. Um, the, the message that your supervisor gave you and likely received used to be like a really dominant message in our field of um, if the client doesn't bring it up, it's pro it probably means it's not important or it's not something that they are grappling with because they haven't explicitly stated it. But the like research really doesn't support that. And clinical um, and empirical evidence really doesn't support that um, because it, 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 in my opinion, um, it really fails to give credence to the power dynamic difference that is uh, inherently in the therapeutic relationship. Um, so I'm, I'm going to very much respectfully disagree with your supervisor. And I'm sure that your supervisor is not the only one that um, sends that message. Has anyone else heard that from like a supervisor or even in class or anything like that of like, if the client doesn't bring it up, don't, don't talk about it. Yeah. I mean, I definitely receive that messaging in my, um, throughout, well, mostly in my master's program, my doctoral program was a little bit different. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, anything else that y'all talked about in your groups? I feel like um, Vanessa Page and I were talking about how like our experience at Alliant is so different and that like we're encouraged to talk about this, whereas like a lot of other therapists, like even in our practicum mm -hmm. probably wouldn't. And so we like have the ability to go there when like a lot of other people may not. Yeah. Does anything inform, like did anyone talk about any sort of hesitancy for talking about larger like cultural or societal influences on the client? Would anyone care to speak to any of the hesitancy? I talked a little bit about it in our group. Um, the first time I brought up um, racial differences, I had a black client and I wanted to address the fact that I'm white, cisgender, heterosexual. And it went really smoothly. Like he really appreciated it. And it kind of opened the door for us to talk about it a lot by just addressing that kind of privilege or power or, um, you know, the, those kind of issues. And it went really well. But then I have a client right now who just disclosed that she was sexually assaulted as a teenager, and she's never brought it up to anyone before. And for some reason, I found it a lot more challenging to talk about gender roles and gender mm. differences with her. I mean, I still did, but it, the conversation didn't go nearly as smoothly as it did with my other client. And so there's something there that I yeah. can't really articulate. I was just going to ask what you think it might be, what might be informing some of the difficulty. I felt like no matter how hard I tried, I was almost reinforcing the power dynamic between male and female. Mm. And um, because I wasn't getting too much response from her either. 
you know, have, trying to have that conversation. Sure. Um, and so it just, I felt like we just left it at, yep, men just have more power than women and it sucks. Mm. And it was like, it didn't really go anywhere from there. Sure. So I felt like I got stuck in that moment. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for bringing that up. And I think um, potentially one thing that you could use therapeutically for you in that situation, Miles, it is your gender identity and, and having it be a reparative experience for your client. Because um, I guess based on your some of the context, I'm assuming that the perpetrator was a man. Um, and so feeling some discomfort in like being a representative or being reminiscent of that in some way. And, um, you know, I, I think you did a beautiful job at, as a first step of acknowledging that being this existing dynamic within the room um, and then continuing to gauge comfort and safety um, because you can't change that part of who you are. Um, and the client's history can't ch be changed either. Um, and societal realities around gender dynamics at this point, they're going to be what they are. Maybe they'll change in, in time. Um, but so accepting many, those levels of reality and, and continuing a conversation around that, um, I think will lead to more um, depth in the conversation. But for now, the acknowledgement and the fact that it's there and you realize that, um, I think you did more um, beneficial things than you're giving yourself credit for by just broaching it. So give it time. Anything else, everyone, before we go into our, um, some meditative stuff? Yeah, Daniel. I just wanted to echo a little bit about what you just said, uh, Dr. Lapon to, uh, to Levi. Because um, I, I do agree, it's a powerful thing to share with, uh, with your client and, and acknowledging that because there's always going to be that, that um, even in sort of the sort of, sort of that uh, feminist uh, uh, approach, right, to therapy, where they're kind of trying to reduce the power, right, the power structure. Obviously, you have power in your role, but I don't, I, I don't really believe that you can totally dismiss it or totally erase it. It has to be acknowledged mm -hmm. between the client and the therapist. So I just want to say, yeah, that's a very powerful uh, acknowledgement between you and your client. And I think it's a positive thing that you are a male therapist for her to be able to work that out with you. So that's what I wanted to echo, so. Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we can do what we can to um, balance as much uh, in terms of like uh, power inequities um, within the room and have that be a really collaborative experience, but it's the human that we're working with and, and our lived experience aren't in a vacuum. So that's, I think that's the piece where some of that messaging around, if the client doesn't bring it up, then we don't have to talk about it um, because we've created a safe space. We've created this equitable, you know, relationship. Therefore, we don't really have to attend to these things outside of the space. Um, which I will argue is a disservice because it's, it's ignoring or potentially dismissing these real uh, like realities of the client by kind of um, convincing ourselves that because we've created a different type of environment within the confines of our four walls, then we don't have to attend to those things. Um, so with that, I'll get off my soapbox on this and we'll continue this conversation next week. Um, so Please make sure that you uh, do these readings for this week so we can have um, some continued conversation about this next week. And then we'll be going into, um, what's our topic for next week? Our topic is resiliency, diversity, and post-traumatic growth. So um, quite a bit of reading. I'll do, I, I'm going to do my best to consolidate the information in a digestible way so we don't have to roll into another one. But anyway, okay, I will stop and we will do some some relaxing. All right, where are we? 
All right, so this one I wanted to show all of you because there's some like music. So there's some constant stimulation um, in the background with this one. So as always, feel free to get into a nice comfortable position. Um, and there's some like mantra stuff that goes on with this. Welcome to this guided meditation. Together, we will take a healing journey to release the stress you hold within and to help you find a relaxed state of mind. Sit down in a relaxing position and close your eyes. Now inhale positive through your nose and exhale negative through your mouth. Pay attention to your breath and releasing what you're holding on to. Feel your heartbeat relaxing and becoming very slow. Relaxing to a place outside of all your worries. Now, as you're in your comfortable space, go back into time and find a place where you were most happy, when you were comfortable with where you were before. And finding a memory that brings you happiness and joy. When you go back into this time, does it bring you the emotional happiness? Does it make you feel warm again? Does it bring tears of joy? To set your mind free. Relax from the world that's around you and slow down. Go to a place where you can just totally let go. Whether that place is in a meadow or whether that place is in the clouds or if it's at the shore of an ocean. Just let yourself be. Don't allow yourself to hold on. Hold on to nothing. Let go of the strings. Let go of the attachments. Let go of the worries. What are the things that you're holding on to? As you think of the things that you're holding on to, forgive them. Let them go by inhaling positive through your nose and then exhaling negative through your mouth. Allowing your body to relax and becoming limp. Letting your mind not wander not thinking of what you have to do after the meditation or what needs to be done. Just being at peace. During this process, do you feel more light or do you feel more heavy? Pay attention to what you feel. Help yourself to let go and to not allow the heaviness to stay inside. Breathe from the bottom of your stomach and bringing all that air 
to the very top and letting it out through your mouth. As you're going to the very bottom of your core, you're visualizing and you're imagining all those issues, all those worries coming out with that breath. And as you inhale through your nose, you visualize white light, positive energy, new beginnings, and happiness. But believe and have hope that things are going to change. They are not going to stay the same. There is hope. It is no longer going to stay the same. It is going to change for the better. And you are going to witness this. And you are going to be a part of this. As you inhale, believe that change is possible. Have the confidence in who you are. Let me take you on a journey to let go and believe in yourself again. Is it going to happen tomorrow? We don't know. Is it going to happen next week? Don't think of what will happen and when it's going to happen. Just let go. And believe that you are the center of the world you live in. Not that things happen around you in a way where you're just stuck in the middle of it, but believe that you are the one who makes these things happen. That you are the one who has the opportunity to bring the blessings and the change in your life. When you believe that, that is the first step to letting go. Having the confidence to let go of the past and the confidence to forgive yourself and others is about allowing yourself to no longer control what has happened or blaming yourself or someone else for what has happened. Dr. Lappin, if you're talking, you're on mute. Don't 
I'm so sorry. Relax your muscles. Let go of the tension that you are holding on to. And know that everything is going to be all right. Connect with the deepest consciousness inside of yourself. Go inside. And what do you feel? Do you feel love? Do you feel tingling? Do you still feel heaviness? Let that feeling arise above until it radiates from off your skin and surrounds your whole body with light. And go from your core and visualize from the core all the way up through your mouth. The energy is now becoming much lighter. You no longer feel heavy. You no longer feel worry. You no longer feel stress. You feel peace. You believe in the future. You believe in yourself. You believe in happiness. You believe in new beginnings. And then inhale all the love, all the confidence inside of you, believing in you. Who are you? Who do you want to be? And bring that out. Do you feel love for you? Can you love yourself? Go to that place now wrap your arms around yourself and love yourself from inside out. All right, everybody. I'm so, <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, I can also leave a, like a link of this if you enjoyed it. So I just wanted to show you another one with like kind of constant sound behind it. And I know that we didn't get through the entire thing. Um, but I'm happy to put that um, in the PowerPoint someplace or just email it to all of you. Um, okay, so we will finish up our conversation or our lecture um, from this week. Make sure that you finish those readings and be prepared with readings from next week um, because it won't take us the whole class period to get through the PowerPoint for this week. Um, as always, if you have any comments or questions or anything, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, and I will see all of you next week. Bye y'all.